in his deed. And those blessings there go along with what Jesus said in Matthew 5. You know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And, and those blessings there, the famous Beatitudes. Um, then, if you're while you're in James, go down to chapter 2, verse 12. The law of liberty is mentioned again, and you can see that they are judged by that. It says, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That's how they want to be judged. There are two, there are two possible judgments for any person. One is that if you have faith in what God has told you, then God is going to judge you according, for Israel it says, according to the law of liberty, which is that Christ's blood will atone for their sins as a result of them, being, of them repenting and being baptized, then believe in the gospel of the kingdom. They looked into that perfect law of liberty, they continued therein, therefore they are judged by that. And so then they get eternal life in the kingdom. The second type of judgment is for all people who refuse to believe or refuse to have faith in what God has told them. That's the great white throne judgment. They are judged not by Jesus' death, but by their own works according to Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And all of those people are judged into the lake of fire. So, um, being judged by the law of liberty is what they want, because then they are trusting in God to save them, to liberate them from the law of sin and death. And so, with that faith in what God has told them, then God says, you're free from the law of sin and death, I give you liberty in Christ, come into my kingdom forever. Whereas if they are not looking into that law of liberty and continuing therein, then they're still subject to the law of sin and death. And so God looks at their works and says, you've sinned, you die. Um, spiritually in the lake of fire there. So, uh, the believers are judged by the law of liberty. And I wrote on your outline that they would look into the perfect law because they see they are a sinner. And then they would continue in that perfect law by the Holy Ghost. We read in Acts 2.38 that if they repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, then they shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost gives them the power to overcome the temptations of the tribulation period. Now when we look in verse 26, now we're going to see what most people will do. The people who are the hearer of the word. Verse 26 is going to be talking about the people who are hearers of the word and not doers. And verse 27 is going to talk about people who are both hearers and doers. So we saw verse 23 and verse 24. That's the hearer only, not a doer. Verse 25 is the hearer and a doer. Verse 26 goes back to the hearer only. And then verse 27 is the hearer and the doer. So the, so the hearer only is going to do what I said, is that they look at that that they're beholding their face in a glass and they see that they're a dirty, rotten sinner, they don't like that. So instead of them looking into the perfect law of liberty, believing the gospel, they put that mirror aside and they say, well, that's got to be wrong. I'm not really that bad. That's, that was wrong what I saw. So let me pick up something that is right. And what is right is something that's right in their own eyes that fits their own pride so that they can look at the mirror and say, oh, I look good in this mirror, so this must be right. Those are the religious people who follow the Jewish apostate religious system, the Babylonian religious system that the Antichrist will have, as opposed to those who are the hearer and doer of the word. Those are looking into God's law, God's religion. And so that's the contrast here. So in verse 26 it says, if any man among you seem to be religious. So these are, God had set up, you know, it's verse 27, it says, pure religion and undefiled. There is, God had set up his own religion. He set up the religion for Israel. It's found in the Old Testament. It's those Ten Commandments, it's the other laws, the sacrificial system the ceremonial laws, the priests, the temple, you know, everything associated with that, that's God's religion that he set up. And he said, have faith in this system that I've put you under, 
and trust that I will bring you into the kingdom myself. You just put yourself under that system and do what I've said to do in that system and then God says he will bring you into the kingdom um, which ultimately is through the blood of Christ. That's the pure religion. But then most of the people because the tribulation period starts when there's a seven year covenant that the Antichrist makes with the nation of Israel. He builds the temple. He institutes the daily sacrifice. Then halfway through he starts going against God's law. He takes away the daily sacrifice. He sets up a graven image, another God, in the temple. He causes all people to worship that. He speaks great blasphemies against God. And so the religion of the, especially that last half is of the tribulation period is a defiled religion. So it says in verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious, these are the people who seem to be following God's religion, but they're really following what the devil set up through the Antichrist. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. What this is referring to is, remember, you got to think tribulation period. And so here's a man among Israel here, and among the little flock of Israel, and he appears to be religious, he appears to be following what God had said, but you can tell by the fact that he doesn't bridle his tongue that he's deceived his own heart. And his religion then is not God's religion, it's vain. Now, God isn't saying that if you become a member of the little flock, then you then you have the silent treatment because you've got to bridle your tongue. You don't talk. That's not what he's saying. Um, in Matthew 10, verses 6 through 8, we see that uh, Jesus commissioned the apostles. He says, go to the cities of Israel and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Heal the sick. Cast out devils. And he says, in Matthew 10, he says, you're going to be doing that, going to all the cities of Israel uh, for the entire tribulation period. You will not have gone over to all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So obviously, they've got to speak. What this is referring to is the pride of religion. And it goes into, I wrote on your outline that in the tribulation period, believing Israel is not to judge. Look in chapter 3, look in James 3, and the first nine verses here, talking about the tongue again. So he talks about bridling not his tongue in James 1.26, and then he gives more detail in James 3. And we're not going to read all of this for sake of time. We'll get into the details more when we get to James 3. Uh, but you can see here... Um, Verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. You can see the pride then coming out of man through the tongue. Verse 9, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. What he's talking about there is if someone, the danger here in the tribulation period is you believe the gospel of the kingdom, and so then you start following religion. Think about today, for example. Today in the dispensation of grace. You trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. You have eternal life. But if you're, what people usually do, if, you, if you've done that, is immediately, oh, oh you got to start going to church. Oh, you got to be part of our church. So they start going to a church. Um, doesn't matter which one. Just, just pick a church, any church. They, they end up picking this church, and then they follow the rules of that church. They're no longer following the Bible, but they're following man-made rules. I mean, some of it might be, you know, good, but others of it is not according to God's Word for today. So they start doing things like, you know, being water baptized or get under a tithing program or something that's not for today and they start doing that 
And then when they're doing those things, then there's a sense of pride that goes along with it. Like, I'm better than so-and-so over here because I tie, or I am on the, I'm a deacon, or I'm on the board, or I'm at church all the time, or I've been baptized, or, you know, you, you come up with this list, and now you seem to be better than everybody else. Well, that's the danger for the little flock. They believe the gospel of the kingdom, they're water baptized, but most of Israel isn't following God and His Word. Just like most of Christianity today isn't following God and His Word. They're following religion. So then you've got the Antichrist and his religion, and that's contrary to God's Word. So then they start getting involved in that, and then they get this pride about themselves. And what, what, uh, what happens in that time is that if you look over in Revelation 13, and verse 15, And he, this is a reference to the false prophet, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Well, if you're a good religious person following the Antichrist, maybe you were saved and you... You were water baptized, you repented, were water baptized. Well, instead of believing God and His Word, you did like what most Christians do today, is you join the popular uh, religion here, which is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist says to uh, bow down to the image of the beast or you're going to be killed. So if you're a good religious person, go over to Matthew 10. If you're a good religious person, then what you're going to do then is you're going to start judging people who don't do that. Why didn't you worship the image? You know, here's the Christ. Here's the Messiah sitting on the throne in the temple. You know, I'm a good Jewish person. Why didn't you do it? So then you start judging others. Matthew 10. Verse 35. Jesus says, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Look in verse 21. The brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. If someone believes the gospel... The danger is they will then, because now they're a good religious person, instead of them believing what God's Word says, the danger is they'll get involved with the Antichrist and his system. And the Antichrist and his system involves judging people to death who don't believe what they say. And so, what James is saying, go over to Matthew 7 now, and basically what God says, what Jesus says in Matthew 7, is that during the tribulation period, your, the believer's responsibility is not to judge people. In terms of, you can judge righteous judgment and see, oh, they're a sinner, I need to get them the gospel. You know, I can see they're a lost sheep, let me give them the gospel, let me do a sign or a wonder so that they may believe. But you are not to condemn them to death. That that's later. They're not, in other words, they're not sitting on the throne in a position of power judging Israel. That comes in the kingdom. That's not during the tribulation period. So that's why Jesus says, Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So what Jesus is saying, that's not for today. It doesn't mean you can't judge the homosexuals. It has nothing to do with that. What it means is that in the tribulation period, the little flock of Israel believes the gospel of the kingdom. And then the danger is that they'll start getting prideful about, well, now I'm better than everybody else. 
Then they join with the Antichrist and apostate Israel because most of what Israel is going to do, they've got that seven-year covenant with the Antichrist. Then halfway through, they start condemning people to death. And so then you start looking at your family and saying, well, you're not a good Jew. I'm going to sentence you to death. I'm going to deliver you over to the apostate Israel to be killed. And what Jesus is saying is that at that time, it's not the time to judge. Rather, they are going to be judging in the kingdom. Look over at Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 28. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, meaning in the kingdom, after you've been regenerated into new life there, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So the twelve apostles, he told them in Matthew 7, judge not lest ye be judged. But here in Matthew 19, 28, he tells those same twelve apostles, you're going to sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What he means is that when you're going through the tribulation period, your role isn't to sit on a seat of judgment and start judging people. Your role is, as he says over in Matthew 10, verse 6, Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. He doesn't say, Go judge people and show them how bad they are and deliver them over to the Antichrist to be killed. That's not their role. Their role is is to go find the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In Matthew 10 there, if you go down to verse 23, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So the whole time, the Son of Man, that's the second coming. So the whole time, from the time they're saved until Jesus' second coming, they're supposed to go to the cities of Israel and preach the gospel of the kingdom to get the lost sheep of the house of Israel to be saved. They don't have time to judge. Once Jesus brings them into the kingdom, he said there in Matthew 19, 28, then you're going to sit on 12 thrones and you'll judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Then look over in Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 16. So it's not just the 12 apostles who get places of judgment but also those other ones who have served the Lord by preaching the gospel of the kingdom during the tribulation period, they get authority as well. Here's the one in Luke 19, 16. Then came the first, this is the one who was given ten pounds, saying, Lord, thy pound, I'm sorry, given one pound, and it says, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. In other words, they're given the gospel, they're given the commandments by the Lord, they're given the word of God, and they go out and preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, they do all that, and the result is they've gained 10 pounds, or in other words, they have uh, gotten the lost sheep of the house of Israel into the kingdom. So then verse 17, he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over 10 cities. So it's not just the 12 tribes of Is the 12 apostles judging the 12 tribes of Israel, but all members of the little flock of, of Israel, if they go out and preach the gospel and they get the lost sheep of Israel saved, then they get authority. They're going to be judging and ruling over their jurisdictions. In this case, this person, because he gained 10 pounds, is a ruler over 10 cities in the kingdom. Okay, so all of that then, now go back to James 1.26. So it says, if any man among you seem to be religious, so this guy seems to be following God, he quotes scripture, but yet it says, he bridleth not his tongue. So in other words, instead of him going out to preach the gospel of the kingdom, he lets his tongue judge. You notice in James 3, 9 that we read before, that with the tongue we bless God and we curse men. That's exactly what the Antichrist, and let me read it verbatim, James 3, 9, therewith, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith, curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. What that verse is saying is that those who follow the Antichrist are going to say, I'm 
doing God a service. I am, I am serving the Lord by taking these people who have not worshipped the image of the beast and turning them in, as we read over in Matthew 10, the, the brother delivering the brother to death, the father delivering the child to death. They think they're doing God a service by doing these things. And so they say we're blessing God by delivering this person over to death, and because they're delivering them over to death, at the same time, they are cursing men. And so that's what James 1.26 is talking about. Because remember the context is what are you going to do? Are you a hearer only? Or are you a hearer and a doer of the word? The hearer only looks at that perfect, that law that's holy and says, oh, I don't like the way I look in that. Puts it aside, then picks up the mirror of the, of the Antichrist religion, the Babylonian religious system. And he says, hey, I can do good in this. I'll prosper, I'll get money, I'll get power. And all I have to do is turn people in for not bowing down to the image of the beast. That's a pretty good deal for me. And so what they're doing then is they're not bridling their tongue. They're using their tongue to bless God, supposedly, and curse men. I'm doing God a service by delivering these men to death. So that's what... James 1.26 says, So if any man among you seem to be religious, you've got that religious mirror, the Babylonian religious system, but you don't bridle your tongue. You're using your tongue to bless God and curse men. It says, Then they have deceived their own hearts. So they think they're doing God a service. They think they're going to be rewarded by God, but they're deceived because they're really sealing their doom in the lake of fire because they've aligned themselves with the Antichrist rather than believing God in His Word. And as it says, this man's religion is vain, or it's empty. And then the contrast, verse 27, this is the one who is both a hearer and a doer of the Word. It says, pure religion and undefiled. So that's believing God's religion, the Jewish religion, the Mosaic Law, and all the commandments there associated with it. Uh, it's undefiled before God and the Father is this. It says, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Okay, so I mentioned they weren't supposed to judge in the tribulation period, but they were supposed to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Um, visiting the fatherless and widows in their affliction, that has to do with we read earlier in Matthew 10 about how the brother delivers brother up to death, the father delivers the child up to death, and they think they're doing God a service. Well, here's the problem is that if the, if the child, and I think it mentioned the child there in Matthew 10. Let me see. Yeah, Matthew 10, 21. It says, The children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. Well, if the children rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death, well, now they are fatherless. They don't have any more parents. And same thing with the widows. If they, if the uh, the children say cause the father to be put to death, or the mother causes the father to be put to death for not worshiping the image of the beast, then the mother ends up being a widow. And and so what this does then, and I wrote on your outline that the fatherless and widows, and it's not always like this, but at least some of them, would be the family members of believing Israel who were killed for not bowing down to the image of the beast. So here are the people in verse 26, James 1.26, are doing this religious service to God, supposedly, and the result then is now they've cut out their income. The father is dead because he wouldn't worship the image of the beast because he believed God and his word. Well, now how are you going to get your income? Now the children need some financial support or the widow, the mother, needs some financial support. And so this gives believing Israel, the little flock, a tremendous opportunity because for the first part, for number one, the remember they are going to obey God's law and not what religion or what the Antichrist teaches them. 
Well, the Mosaic law obligates them to take care of fatherless and widows. Look over in Deuteronomy chapter 10. So because families are split apart due to some of them put to death for not bowing down to the image of the beast, there are going to be these fatherless children or these widows where their, where their husbands have died. And remember, the little flock of Israel is going to believe God and His Word. They're still going to follow the Mosaic Law. Deuteronomy 10 verse 17 For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. So God looks out for the fatherless and the widow. Look over chapter 14, Deuteronomy 14. Verse 29, when it talks about the tithes here, they give the tithes not money, but food. And look who partakes in the tithes. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come, and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. The tithe there goes to help the fatherless and the widow. And then look over in chapter 24, verse 19, Deuteronomy 24, and verse 19. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, Thou shalt not go over the bows again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Again, God taking care of the fatherless and the widows. And they are obligated. He says, when you work, I mean, it's your field. It's your produce. Don't take it all. Leave some for the fatherless and the widow. In other words, you obey the Mosaic law by helping out the fatherless and the widows. So in James 1.27, he says to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Well, this is a tremendous opportunity because you think about it, these people who are fatherless and widows have just put their parents or their spouses to death. Or, if they didn't do it, somebody else did. And they all seem to be doing it in the name of God. Now, if I, as a member of the little flock, come in the name of God, and I preach the gospel of the kingdom, and the Antichrist and their system is in the name of God, and they're doing what they're doing, causing you to worship the image of the beast, if you've just lost your father or your husband, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the person, the member of the little flock who comes in, preaches the gospel of the kingdom, heals the sick, who uh, raises the dead, who cleanses the lepers, who casts out devils? Are you going to believe their message? And then they come along and they visit you and help you in your affliction as the, and they say, well, why are you doing this to us? You know, we we're out here persecuting people like you. We, we killed our, our father because he was associated with you. And then you go to scripture like Deuteronomy and say, because God's law says that I should help you out. And they show that. Then that person who just put their father to death is more likely to say, maybe I got this all wrong. Maybe the gospel of the kingdom is true. Because here you are risking your life to help me and you're obeying God's word. And these other people say they're obeying God's word, but they don't have scripture to support what they're doing, and they're killing people. Which side is God on? So you see the tremendous opportunity that here's religion, the Antichrist religion is going to say, you know, you should die. I'm cursing you. 
But then the pure religion and undefiled of the believing remnant, the little flock, is saying, here are some people whose family members have been killed. Let's go help them. And what that does then is a demonstration of God's love to them so that then they have the opportunity to share the gospel of the kingdom so that they may believe and come in. It's another way to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so, um, and so that, that's about the fatherless and the widows there. Um, notice also that that's what they do as far as